Yeah. You that guys was look like you're in the South 40. Come oh. on up here. Can you move up a little bit? This is just too weird. It's like a concert. Oh my gosh. You got it. It just it feels weird if you're leading worship in there on the south floor. Yeah. Yeah. We want it to be more like, feel more like a family than a concert. Yeah, if you need to move the trees, just move the trees and get in the sunshine. Do whatever you need to do. By the way, uh, Clover brought a bunch of treats over there. There's some muffins and some chips and some drinks, so you're feel free to have any of that you want. If anybody wants to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior, talk to Kevin. He's like... Isn't it beautiful out today? Isn't this just a beautiful day? I love how you guys get in your Christian rows. That's really cool. All lined up. Why don't you just reach over to somebody that's next to you and, and just pray for them. That this experience would be really good for them. That they really feel close to Jesus right now. We don't want to. We don't want to go alone today. We want to be with you. We want to be yours. We want this to be our time with you too, and not just out in the park and with each other. But we want to be with you right now. We're so grateful for everything you've given us. So thankful to be together. I just worship you, Jesus for who you are. You're the most important thing that's happening right now. You're the most important thing in our lives. And so we just want you to know that right up front. Lord. And pray that this would be a remarkable time with you and with each other. Take us deeper today. Let us become stronger today in you. We love you, Jesus.
And the heartbeat of my life Is to worship in your life Cause your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful Your glory is so beautiful Fall to No, Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. And with your eyes, oh, oh, this child, your grace abounds to me. Yes, you
This week I was thinking about when you're when God lights a fire in your heart, like you can burn anything that comes at you. So I was I had like six burning heart songs, <laughs> and I narrowed it down to one. But that and it was fun because I was doing another a list, and then at the end of that last song it says, Oh Lord, please light the fire. That was bright and clear Replace the lamp of my first love That burned with all the heat And I was like, oh, that's fun, because one of the songs I had was and for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. Light a flame in my soul for every eye to see. For the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me. I'm laying my life, I'm giving up control, I'm never looking back, I surrender, I'm living for your glory, only you. This passion in my heart, the story in my soul. For all the world to know, I'm living for your glory on the earth. For the sake of the world, I can fire in me, light a flame in my soul. my last song.
everyone have their communion? Looks like it. Okay. So, if, I, if this falls off and I later, I'll pick it up later. Okay, this is one of my favorite communion verses. Because it's what we're being right now. We're being a family. I love this. We're all being together as one. And um, this is what the Lord wants us to do. And in, in fact, um, in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives a visual with communion of just what we're doing right now. So it's 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. It says, when we bless the cup at the Lord's table, aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? If you could kind of hold up your juice, that's, that's the blood of Christ. So we're sharing in the blood of Christ. And when we break the bread, aren't we sharing the body of Christ, which is your chapter? And then it says, and though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. And I just love that, that, that um, Apostle Paul gave this visual in communion of what we're supposed to be, which is what we're being right now. We're being a family. We all have our little, our little fishy crackers. Just imagine that that's a piece of bread, and that when we put that together, it makes one loaf, one loaf of bread. So in that visual, we are one. We're one body, we're a family, and we're taking communion together as such. And how are we knitted together in that way? Okay. It's the fact that it's through the blood of Christ. It's through the breaking of the bread, his body that we share was broken for us. That's just remarkable when you think about it. So keep being a family and keep being one. So let's start with the text. So Lord, thank you that your body was broken for us, that you went to the cross on our behalf because you saw you saw the long-term picture. You saw the long-term picture that, that down the road, there would be a body called Evangel that would be together right now, this day, and it joins us together and makes us one. So we can take it back. And Lord, thank you for this juice that represents your blood that was shed on the cross for us. We thank you that one drop of this washes as white as snow. And again, Lord, because of these elements, it just binds us together in one. Where we're one together now, but we also get to be one with you in eternity. And we just thank you for that. You can take the cup. Amen. I don't know you, about you, but I'm, a, I'm preparing for the apocalypse. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. Aye. Get us out of normal. Get us out of everything that we think that we have control of. Lord, please rescue us. Rescue us from, uh, I, got, I got this. I got this. Everything's in control. Um... I'm not very good at being in control. Are you? Are you? You like being in control? Really? Clover, you don't like being in control? Kids, does your mom like being in control? Oops. I, I just think that we are so, we got this so handled. And... Uh, that's what I like about being out here. Like everything in the world goes wrong. We were we had we were set up clear over there at first, because and then we realized I realized that the sun was going to shine on all of us and you, you're going to be warm and toasty and not be able to see. And so we moved everything over here. Then things are you know like we have to figure out how to make everything work. And I think that the days ahead are going to be kind of like that, where we're not going to be able to depend on just coming into a comfy place and being together, but we're going to have to kind of reach out to each other and make things work together, and, and we're preparing for that. 
I mean, I thought that this was a response to the pandemic at first. Now I'm thinking this is going to be life for us. We need to be ready to do anything that we need to do to be able to gather together and worship Jesus and move all the obstacles and the obstructions out of the way and be able to do what we need to do to be who we've been called to be. We are not, we've not been called to be people who attend church. The gatherings on Sundays are not who we are. You're not the church that gathers on Sundays. You're followers of Jesus. Really, you are followers of Jesus. We are all followers of Jesus. That, that whole identity of, let, Lord, just, you know, lead me to my chair on row four at Evangel, and I'll, and I'll park there and, and watch the show and then leave a couple hours later. Those days are over. COVID set us free from that. So anytime we gather, God can heal. Anytime we gather, there can be miracles that happen. Amen. Next week, we're going to be over at Rainier, Assembly of God, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And the only reason we're going there is because there is a hope that all heaven's going to break out in our region, that we want to see things change radically. Does that mean that the speaker is going to make that happen? Absolutely not. Is it about the water and the baptisms? Absolutely not. There's nothing we can lean on and nothing we can depend on except Jesus. And he's the reason that we're gathering over there. So Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night at 7, we're going to gather and ask God to move. I and mean, we've been doing this for over 30 years. We've been asking God to move in our community. And we're not going to stop. Because we believe there's got to be more than this. And we're, we want to position ourselves for that. So a lot of what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, at least what, I, what I've been teaching about, has been daring to be different. And every time we gather together, there's an opportunity for God to do something that we've never seen before. And today I want to talk about how we guard our hearts. And I don't know if you realize this, but the world is not much for guarding our hearts. They're more like, you need to follow your heart. Look what Martina McBride, the, the country singer, says. Faith is not always in your hands or things don't always go the way you plan. But you have a faith that there is a plan for you and you must follow your heart and believe in yourself no matter what. Amen? No. <laughs> no. Not amen. No. Following your heart is not the key. Robert Kennedy, our... Uh, uh, political leader said this there are a lot of years I was trying to do things that other people wanted me to do but you have to follow your heart in other words he was saying there were things that people wanted him to do but you have to follow your heart believe that you have a unique group of talents and abilities that are going to allow you to accomplish something in an area that interests you work at that and try to make some kind of contribution to your community which sounds really good but following your heart is not the ticket. It's not the answer. And the famous psychologist, Alfred Adler, said this. Follow your heart, but take your brain with you. <laughs> ah, I kind of like that one. <laughs> Follow your heart, but take your brain with you. Following your heart doesn't work. It really doesn't work. The culture tells you that you should follow your heart. But Moses says something quite different. Moses gave this as an admonition to the people of Israel. Listen, O Israel. The Lord our God is one. The Lord alone and you must love the Lord with all your heart all your soul all your strength and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today so Moses commanded them was to love God with all of our hearts not follow the heart that we have not follow what's in our own hearts and the Bible Bible is full of warnings not to follow your heart when Moses followed his heart he killed an Egyptian in faith faithlessly struck a rock. When Balaam followed his heart, he was rebuked by a donkey. When Nebuchadnezzar followed his heart, he ended up eating like an ox for a long time. When Haman followed his heart, he ended up hanging from the gallows he made. There's a lot of people in the Bible who have tried to follow their heart, and it didn't work out so well for them. When the disciples tried to follow their heart, they got in all kinds of trouble. And when Ananias and Sapphira tried to follow their heart, they got killed. So following your heart is not exactly what is recommended. Um, John Bloom wrote a book called Don't Follow Your Heart. 
And it's an excellent book. It's, a, it's 31 days, so it's kind of like a devotional. You read a page a day. And the whole book is about trying to condition yourself not to follow your heart. And he said this, follow your heart is a creed embraced by billions of people, especially in this culture, especially now. It's a statement of faith in one of the great popular, a pop culture myths of the Western world, a gospel proclaimed in many of our stories, movies, and songs. Follow your heart is a gospel message. It's a message of good news to people. If you'll just follow your heart, everything will be fine. If you just follow your heart, the things that you want will really be given to you. So remember, we're talking about guarding your heart, but you have to kind of understand what your heart is, at least when the Hebrew, the ancient Hebrews were talking about hearts. The heart that they were talking about, actually, if you look at the Hebrew, um, the Hebrew words, they're actually pictures, and each letter is a picture. And in the word heart, it's actually two letters, and the word for heart is lev, and the first letter is lemed, and it means staff or control. It looks kind of like a shepherd's crook. And the other letter, because you're reading, if you look at your notes, you're reading from right to left in, in uh, Hebrew. The second letter is bet, which means house. And so literally the word heart in a Hebrew understanding means the authority within, the authority that's within us. Heart is revealed in scripture as the center of our emotion, the center of our feelings, the center of our thoughts. When we think of heart, we think of our just emotions and feelings. But actually in the biblical understanding, the Hebrew understanding of heart, it actually has to do with the way you think. So in Revel or, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when it says God transforms us by changing the way we think, what he's saying is, what Paul's writing is, but God transforms us by changing our heart. And if you look through the Old Testament, you'll find that reference to a heart change a lot throughout Hebrew Scripture. In Biblical Hebrew, the heart is where we feel feelings and think thoughts. In, the ancient, in fact, the ancient Hebrew didn't even have a word for mind, brain. There was no word for brain. It was all about your heart. Um, it was all about what was at the center of you and who you were. In Jeremiah 15, verse 16, it says, When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are, my, they are my joy and my heart's delight. So there's a sense that your heart can feel and it has emotions. For I bear your name, O Lord, the God of heaven's armies. And then in Proverbs 14, it says, Wisdom is enshrined as an, in an understanding heart. And this, this whole idea of understanding is a really big deal when it comes to heart stuff. We'll talk about, I'll talk about it in just a second, but when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life, where does that happen? In your brain? Do you believe in your brain? No, you believe in your heart, right? And we'll look at that in just a second. But where that whole activity happens when we get saved, when we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, that all, that's all a heart thing. That all, we believe in our hearts. We believe in our hearts. And so when it's talking about this idea of understanding, it's talking about an idea, the idea of you understand what God is saying, what he means, what he wants, and you understand it at a heart level. Our hearts also where we make choices. The concept of hearts best understood by the inner person, the seed of our mind, thoughts, emotions, feelings, intentions, that kind of stuff. The bad news is, um, the bad news in the Bible is that our hearts our inner selves is fundamentally broken. So what we get saved from is a broken heart, a heart that doesn't work, a heart that's overwhelmed by sin. That's what we got saved out of. I, mean, I remember what I was like before I was a Christian. I was really not that great of a person. I mean, I looked good on the outside. I was accomplished and I was successful in my own eyes anyway. But for all intents and purposes, I was a self-absorbed mess. I, I would follow my heart my whole life. I did what I wanted my whole life, and I really enjoyed it. I really, I mean, I enjoyed all the partying. I enjoyed all the relationships I had. I enjoyed all the fun that I had. I really enjoyed being a heathen. 
beans. I really did. I mean, I don't want why being a heathen gets such a bad rap. It's really fun. That was one of the big considerations I had when I when I came face to face with Jesus. Am I have to stop having fun because I I'm not sure that you can have fun as a Christian legally. <laughs> But I kept watching people, I, especially Jody. I watched how she did life. I, she smiled a lot. And she talked to Jesus all the time. Like he was sitting right next to her. Which was kind of intriguing, that whole idea. But I looked around and, you know, Randy Russell was going around hugging people and smiling and telling them, I love you, bro. And I was like, what? <laughs> this is like either a, the biggest deception of the world or it's something I really need to pay attention to and take a look at. And so my heart, I felt, was in a good place. But I was following my heart. I was doing whatever I wanted to do. And when I came face to face with Jesus, and it took a while, it was really a process for me anyway. Some of you have these kind of, you know, explosions and fireworks go off and all of a sudden one day you're saved. For me it was a process. I had to, I had to kind of convince myself that it was worth giving up my control of my heart and letting God control it. And it took a while. But when it took, it took big time. I wasn't going back. And I still don't want to go back. And I still look at the things I used to do and the things that other people do and I think following your heart makes sense if you don't have a Savior. And if you don't understand the depth of what it means to be His. And that understanding is what really changes inside of us. So, the heart is where we make choices. The bad news in the Bible is that our hearts are enslaved because of sin. The good news is that God can change our hearts in an instant. The moment we place our faith in Jesus. Look at these scriptures in uh, Jeremiah 17, verses 9 and 10. The human heart is most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. There's one side of the story. The other side of the story is Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, where did that happen? What did I just read? Believe in your heart. Believe in your heart. If you believe in your heart, you will be saved. I mean, have you ever been around people and you think, they say they're Christians, but they really don't look like Christians. They don't act or talk like them. And you find out, you know, Maybe they didn't really believe this in their heart. Maybe they just want to start going to church. Maybe they just started hanging out with Christian friends. Maybe they really haven't had that experience where they've had a heart change or they believed in their heart. And it's, I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, it kind of scares me that we have so many people in the church who aren't really convinced in their heart that they're saved. If you talk to them about what it means to be a Christian, they can't have a conversation with you. That's why it's so important to be able to articulate what you believe. Because you can't believe something that's not, not true for you. I mean, you can't say something that's not true. You can't just make stuff up. At some point, you have to actually believe it enough to articulate it. And that's kind of where we're at right now. We're at that place where we need to be able to begin to articulate more and more because there are more and more people that are going to want to be. They're going to be want to be saved. They, they need a relationship with Jesus. Their lives are just not going well, and they really need something more. And you guys are going to be the ones who are standing face to face with them. And what they're going to want to know is, well, how do I get from where I'm at right now to where you are? And the the, the answer to that question is, you need to believe in your heart that He's Lord. You need to believe in your heart. Not just repeat some words after me. Not just, you know, just quote scripture at them and have re repeat that scripture. But they need to believe in their hearts. Do you guys, do you know people like that? That you think, man, they say they're, they go to church, but they, you know, like, they can't really have a conversation about who it is they believe in. We need to help each other and encourage each other. That's a lot of what we do this for. You know, it's not because we have to go to church on Sunday. It's because we're learning how to articulate what it is we believe. Every time I do this, I'm rehearsing in my own life what it is I believe. There's no, there's no like school to go to. I mean, it's called discipleship. 
That's what it's called. The process is called discipleship. And that's what God's called us to do is make disciples. What if 50 people walk into Evangel this week because of what happens over in Rainier? What are you going to do? Because I'm not going to do it all. I don't have the time or energy to disciple 50 people. I'm going to turn to you and say, hey, Patrick, there's a couple guys over here that want to know what it means to walk with Jesus. Could you just like spend some time with them for a little bit and just get them on track? You know? So we got to send them to Patrick? <laughs> well, Patrick will just send them to you. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I have fun dreaming about this stuff. What would it be like if everything changed? What would it be like if all the things that we pray about and want to see happen, what if they actually start happening? What if somebody hears this, this in the park right now and they come over here and they sit? Are we just going to ignore that? They came over here for a reason. They want to hear for a reason. And I think those are the things that are going to change soon. And I'm really excited about it. Let me finish Romans 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. So what happens in our heart is really a big deal. What's in your heart is really a big deal. And um, it is by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. So believe in your heart that you're made right with God and by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. So believing in your heart and articulating with your mouth is really a big part of who, of a demonstration of who you are in Christ. So the text for all this, let me just read this really quickly. Um, if you look in Proverbs 4.23, it says, um, guard your heart because it will be a wellspring of life. That's what Proverbs 4.23 says. So if you look at it in, out of context, all it says is guard your heart because that's where life comes from. But look what it says before that in verses 23-22. It says, fill your heart with the truth. Guard the instruction of God in your heart. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me read this. It says in uh, verse 20, My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to you, uh, those who will find them, and healing to their whole body. So that's what it says in 20 through 22. Pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. And then it says, guard your heart. First it says, let it penetrate deep into your heart, the words I have to say. And then it says, guard your heart. So what you're guarding is what you let penetrate deep into your heart. If you don't let it penetrate deep into your heart, there's nothing to guard. We think guarding our heart is keeping, not watching bad TV shows and not listening to bad music and not watching things that we shouldn't watch and hearing things we shouldn't hear. That's not what guarding your heart is. Guarding your heart starts with letting stuff penetrate deep into your heart. Now that can happen. I remember the first time, it was before I was a Christian, I watched The Exorcist. That penetrated deep into my heart. I don't know about you, but that got in there. That was, that was, a, that was, that was I'd never seen anything like that before. I'd never heard of anything like that before. And um, that really healed me from watching horror movies. And some of you like horror movies. I don't understand that. Because you're letting stuff into your heart that really creates an image there. It really, I mean, I, it took, I had to get saved from The Exorcist. I, got, I had to get saved from a, a lot of other things too. But what I got saved from partially was what I, what I saw on that screen. And I mean, the pictures were in my mind. They were, they were actually in my heart. And some of you, have, you've, you've seen things with your eyes, heard things with your ears that have made an impre impression upon you. And that's literally what you get saved for. God transforms you by changing the way you think. 
So that's the first part of it. Fill your heart with the truth. And the second part is this. So, it's, so then it says, um, guard your heart. Because it's a wellspring of life. And then it says, avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. So it says, let good stuff penetrate into your heart. Then guard your heart. And then it says... Look straight ahead, fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark a straight path for your feet and stay on that safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. So if you look at the whole section of scripture in context, what you hear is, let God's instruction deep into your heart, then guard it, and then begin to live out of that heart experiences that come from what you put in it. Now you can start to understand why it's so, so important for us to be in the Word. I'll tell you, I am in the Word every day, and some of the days I can't even remember anything I said 15 minutes later, or anything I read 15 minutes later. But I'm convinced that it goes in and makes a place in my, it roots itself in my heart. I just know it. And that confidence keeps me going back to the Word, whether I feel like I'm getting something out of it or not. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you are. And sometimes one word or one phrase can just make a huge impact on your heart. Like when it said, when I read, guard your heart, I'm thinking, what do you mean, Lord? What, do you, what am I guarding it from or for or why? And what I realized after taking a look at this all was that everything that's good comes out of my heart. As a believer, everything that makes a difference in your life will come out of my heart. It won't come out of my study. It won't come out of my uh, opinions. It comes out of my heart. And we can't hide that kind of stuff. You, if you put perverse stuff in your, into your heart, perverse stuff is going to come out. It will. And I don't know how to reconcile that except to say that we just need Jesus more than we ever thought we did. We really need him badly. We need him in our lives. We need him to make an impression upon our hearts. We need him to change us from the inside out. So guarding your heart, as far as being set apart from the world, is, I think, key to where we're at right now. Most people open their hearts way too much to way too much. Most of the time we end up polluting our hearts because we lack understanding. It's not because we really want to. It's just we don't think it's going to make a difference. And it used to be that you had to watch really bad movies for that to happen. Now all you have to do is watch TV. The commercials will take you out. I mean, it's, it's really crazy how our culture has changed so drastically. And I'm not a big person on no TV. I'm not a big person on no anything, really. I don't like preaching what you shouldn't do. But I want to stick with and, and be focused on what we should do. And what we should do is put some significant things in our heart that will make a difference. I think what, what's happening here today is you getting something put in your heart that's significant. I don't know if you got, you know, the people that came up got healed today. I don't know if you just sitting here and realizing you're with a bunch of crazy Christians out in a park, just doing church. I mean, we could be in a building. It'd be a lot easier. It would have gone a lot smoother. But there's something about challenging our hearts to receive Jesus here that is getting us ready for more, getting us ready for more, more that he's about to do. John Bloom again says this, so many of the things that cause us the most difficulty and heartache in life, the source of so much of our anxiety, fear, and doubt, and anger. Wow. So many of the things that cause us the most difficulty and heartache in life, the source of so much of our anxiety, fear, and doubt, and anger with others and with God is the result of leaning on our own understanding. We just trust ourselves way too much. We think we're smarter than we really are. We think we're holier than we really are. We think that we can stand up against the world much more than we really can. And what we really need is we need to be in that position with Jesus where we're leaning on him, where our hope is in him and our trust is in him and our faith is in him. 
Our hearts were designed to be the place where God's word was held, protected, and nurtured. That's what our hearts were designed for. Our hearts were designed for God himself. They were designed to hold on to God himself. Evangel's going through a transition right now. And um, I hope you're praying for us as a body. I hope in your times of prayer you're praying for us as a body. Because what we're going to be is going to be so much more powerful and deeper than what we are right now. I mean, all I can say is just hold on to your hats because things are going to change drastically. And you're going to find yourself doing some things that you thought only the more mature in Christ do. Only the more seasoned in Christ do. God's going to call us into some places where we're going to be we're going to be encountering him and encountering other people in ways that are going to be really challenging for us. Some of you aren't used to helping other people grow in Christ. You're, you've been like sponges and soaking it up, but that's, those days are about to change. You're going to find yourself more and more letting yourselves be poured out into other people on, 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 on behalf of Jesus. And it's really exciting. My encouragement to you today and, and for this next season is, man, be ready to change. Make a way, make a place in your heart for more. More understanding. Not more meetings, but more understanding of who he is. Make a place in your heart to begin to articulate what it is you believe. I mean, even if it, you know, start talking to your friends and tell them what it is you believe. Talk to your children. You know, if you're, maybe you just need to talk to the mirror. But begin to articulate what it is you believe. Begin to get stronger on the inside. It's the key to everything we're about ready to walk into. And I'm really excited for what's going to happen in Longview Kelso. I think that we're going to see some fantastic things happen. But the most important things that happen are going to happen with us together, not individually and separately. And that goes for churches too. I, I think that in the days ahead, the most powerful things are going to happen when congregations work together. I talked to a pastor yesterday who said, uh, I don't know how he found out, but... He said, well, have fun in the, at, at the park tomorrow, I'm meeting in the park. And I don't know, I just texted him back and said, you want to come with us? You want to do it with us? I've talked to three, three churches that want to go out and have church with us in the park this summer. And so the next time we go out, there'll probably be another church with us. And it's just like, we got to do this together. We need to do this together. You and I need to do this together. This isn't a... This is the days of the one-man show are over. It's time for us to work together and believe together and hope together for the days ahead. So be praying for evangel. Be praying that we would become everything God created us to be. This church was founded 30 years ago with a vision to break down walls in this community. We're about ready to do that at a whole new level. And I'm really excited about it. I'm excited for myself and for you that we're going to find ourselves doing some things that are powerful in the days ahead. And I can't wait. I think, it, I think we've been being prepared for it for some time. Anybody have anything I want to offer? Is God stirring your heart up in you? Come on up. You want to say something? Oh, you were just agreeing. <laughs> come here. Come here. Come on up. Let's do it. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. But I'm excited to hear what you have to say. That's for sure. Come on up. Somebody else come up, too. If you got something to say, this is your chance to preach in the park. What's your name? Stephanie. Stephanie? Hello. <laughs> so I'm just excited for what the Lord is doing and stirring the hearts of his people. He, um, it, like he said, it's not a plan for like just a one-man show. We're to be unified together and crying out to God and believing for more. Because we're not here just to live life. We're here to experience miracles and watch our family members get saved and watch them get healed and just watch the hand of God move like never before. Because that's, that's what he wants to do. He wants to wake us up. 
and um, that's that's happening and I'm excited about it like you hear about healings and miracles in other countries it's because they're they don't have what we have we have comfy chairs we have food they're strictly relying on the hand of God and I feel like as soon as we get to that point of like dying to our flesh like not caring about anything but asking God give us you like we want you we want more of you we don't care about being comfortable and like knowing where we're going when we die we want to see you move and once we get that in our heart i feel like we're really going to see a huge difference yeah. <laughs> man that's absolutely right stephanie yeah come on up lisa then don't wait for don't wait just go on up now if you have something you want to share this is a good time for you to articulate what's going on inside. Well, I don't know about what is articulating going on inside. I just found a Nerf pellet. There is. Yes. Um, <laughs> Pick it up. All right. Um, just on what you said, Stephanie. Yeah. I feel like God is asking some of us to become more undignified. For me. So as you. As you can see, that was my husband laughing. As you can see, you know, some of us are flagging, and that's new, and I'm not comfortable with it, but I'm, I'm dedicated to worship in a creative way, the Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father. So I'm, what's on my heart is I'm excited, and I'm inviting others to become more undignified if the Spirit asks you to, because there's another level that God has for you. That's it. Somebody else, come on up. Brian. You better be careful. Brian's coming. There's, there's something about getting stretched out of your comfort zone um, and doing things differently than what you've always done before. I, I want to talk about a story that, that goes way back. Um, when Dana and I first got married, and it was early in our relationship, uh, she was raised, or when, was saved in a church of Christ. And they don't have any instruments. They, they, they worship, but they worship all a cappella. <laughs> well, we, our first two years of marriage was spent in Africa, and we didn't have any instruments. And she had a, such a freedom to worship that I didn't have because I was dependent upon, I needed a, that guitar and that drum and, and, and the instruments that, and, and kind of, being out here is kind of stretching us in the same way in that we don't need to have the, 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 the pews and the, the straight lines and the, the, the program of everything that's planned out just the way, just so. And it's just an exciting thing because you are all of a sudden asking God, okay, now what next? Well, how do I worship you in this situation? How do I worship you in this, this new setting the, in a park? How do I worship you in a park? Because I know what it's like in, in the church building. And, and, it, and it creates a new dependence upon God and the Holy Spirit than just the program of what Jeff puts together or what the worship team puts it together. And it's just a, an exciting thing to do. I love what, you, what, uh, what we're doing here. And it's the, that's good. It's the potential that exists. You know, the thing that we're guarding, let me, let me just say it this way. The thing that we're guarding is what we care most about. If you care most about your job, you'll guard your heart when it comes to your job. If you care most about money and have enough money, you'll be fearful and hold on to all your money and you won't want to give it away and you won't want to do anything with it because you're afraid you're not going to have any more. So whatever we care about, the treasure is that's in our heart, that's what, we, that's what we're guarding. So if, we're, if, if the passion we have for Jesus, the intensity, Jody, come on up for a second. She's been preaching to me all week, so I'm going to let her preach to you for a while. You can hear it. You know, but it's the, it's the thing that says, whatever she's about to share is the thing that we're guarding. We're holding on to and not letting anybody else get a hold of. We need to guard the passion we have for Jesus so that nothing else takes its place in our life, right? <laughs> Um, I just kind of feel sad. Um, I think I think it's. I mean, I, 
I hope it's the Holy Spirit, but I just kind of feel that Jesus is just here. And like Jeff said, oh yeah, you talk to Jesus like he's here. He is here. He's here. He's here for you. And we want to know him. We want to be close to him. We want to have that 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 interaction where, like Jeff sang those songs, the fire, the presence, the face of the living God in our midst. We want that. But it's sometimes I just feel like we sell ourselves short. We just don't realize that he's just right here. And we do all these things and we say all these things when in reality, if we could just know and believe that he is right here and he's looking at us and he sees you. He sees you not as you are, but he sees you as who he created you to be. And he delights in that. And you're so beautiful before him. And as you look into his face, the living God that died on the cross for you, and he did it for you, as you look into that face of Jesus, there's nothing else you can do than say, I love you, and I want you more. And he's just right there. It's an open door. There truly is an open door. And it's going to become more open as the times get darker. I mean, I don't want the end times. But you know what? I want more of Jesus. And I want his presence. And I want to walk into work and feel his kiss on me. I want to come here in the midst of this beautiful place and not feel darkness, but feel the light of his presence. I want to be with my grandchildren and know that the living God has his hands on their life. And I don't have to ever be afraid for them. And that's what he has for us. And, um, sorry, it's so emotional, but it's, he is here for you. He's not here for this. He's here for you. And he loves you that much. And I just want that for you, too. Amen. Now, let me, just a second. Here. Did, <laughs> did that come from her heart? Yeah. Right? And Lisa's heart, and Stephanie's heart, and Brian's heart. That's what you got to protect. That's what you're guarding is that. I don't want, like, if Jody's the most important thing to me, and, except for Jesus, if she's the most important thing to me, how much conversation do I want some nice looking guy to have with her over dinner? None! I'm going to guard that relationship. She's not going to let me go out and spend a lot of time with anybody else that's any other woman but her because she's guarding our relationship. I set some things in place to guard our relationship. The same thing is true with our relationship with Jesus. There are things every single day that want to take the place of Jesus in your heart. I don't want any of that stuff there. I'm going to guard my heart. And the best way to do that is to put the lifeblood of Jesus, the Word of God, into it. I mean, I, I love this because what those guys shared, what those four different people shared, was their heart. And that's what I'm saying. Protect it. Guard it. Keep it safe. Don't let anybody steal from it. Don't let anybody take it away. Amen? Amen. Amen. We should do that. We should do that. Anybody want to pray over the group? Kevin, why don't you come out and pray? You love praying. Not Kevin? Which one? Not Kevin. Come on, get up here. <laughs> They're both looking at each other. <laughs> and Clover brought a bunch of stuff down here. Don't make her take it home. I think Jody needs to come pray for us. <laughs> So one thing I've learned in my profession, as a ton of my job, as a, I'm a professional garbage man, so I've learned that garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> garbage goes in, and the garbage is going to come out. It doesn't come out in brick of gold, that's for sure.
So what you put in your heart's going to come out. So. Jesus, I just pray this morning that you do guard our hearts, Lord. You help us guard our hearts. And that we put only you in our hearts, Lord. That we be in your word, studying and searching out the things that you have for us, God. We pray, pray for our protection over everybody that's, that's in this area today, God, in this city, in this county. We pray that um, your people would continue to, to uh, be an example of the church and the body wherever we go, Lord. We pray that um, this word that Jeff had for us this morning, it would, it would, it would go deep within our hearts, God. It would, that, we would, that we would chew on it, we would ponder it, Lord, and that there would be true transformation. That we just didn't walk away and just forget everything we learned today, God. And we just pray continue to work in the hearts of these people, Lord, that your fire would continue, Lord. That we would pray for this revival service coming up, Lord. That there would be hearts changed, God. That there would be people saved, Lord. That people's lives would be transformed. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We like celebrations, too. Come on up, Lisa. Um, Mike and Renee are celebrating 50 years. Really quick, I just um, I made a friend with one of the a, one of the helpers at Dawsonville North Georgia Revival, and so we stayed in touch. And she knows about my healing, um, but she just texted me this morning. She said Pastor Todd mentioned this morning he and Pastor Karen are going to Oregon tomorrow morning and being there three days. She says please let them know about your healing. We're going to be praying tonight, Monday. Through Wednesday, corporately for your church and pastors, for the fire of God and revival to fall in your church. It's been my prayer for a long time to have revival go across the country. So I've been a part of a few churches going up the East Coast and Middle America. So you're in line for the West Coast. May the Lord come and sit down in your house and see signs and wonders and your testimony helps others believe may anyone that comes looking for a miracle find the lord and may they be healed in jesus holy name yeah so i just thought that was encouraging that they're corporately praying for what's going to happen here not for what may but for what's going to happen here so be encouraged bless you guys so are you coming up lisa want to pray something over us lord we want first love yeah yeah that's what revival looks like when we turn away from anything other than you being in first place we want that we want from the moment we rise to the moment that we go to bed and even through the night hours we want that communion with you we want that awakened. We want that loosed over this nation, over this region, Lord. And we agree that any place in our hearts that's been dull, any place where we have um, grown weary in doing well, any place, Lord, where we've let the distractions of the earth get in the way, we just submit those things to you right now. And we ask, Lord, that you would loose over us that passion, that passion for you to be in first place. Lord, that we would not be, um, we would not be Laodicea. Lord, we ask that, that you would stir within us the ability to go through that open door. We want to eat of your word. I pray, Father, that as you awaken us, as you light this region on fire with your presence, that as you do that, it would be a devouring hunger for your word, a hunger for your presence, a hunger for your transformation, a hunger for your beauty, a hunger that would ignite this full region up and down the I-5 corridor. 
And I just pray for supernatural grace, that which can't be stirred up in our own flesh, but supernatural grace to enter into what you want to do. And I just thank you. We bless your holy name and we say your name is above every other name. We lift your name high and we say thank you for all that you have done and all that you're doing. And I just want to release a blessing over Mike and Renee yeah, yeah. and the fact that they spent 50 years together allowing your heart to refine their hearts and to be all that they were created to be, Lord. We just bless them and we thank you for them. What a cool thing you've done, Lord. Amen. I feel like I have a word for Joel, too. Where do you go? Where's he at? Joel, um, I felt like this week the Lord's going to drop something really significant into your heart. Um, to just make yourself ready this week for some pretty significant things to happen in your heart. I feel like he's going to drop some things in. Maybe some, uh, some sense of direction for the future that you've been praying for, asking about. I, I, I just, the sense I have is there's a lot of words for a lot of people in this, in this place right now. If you feel like God's giving you a word for somebody, just go over to him. We'll, we'll dismiss and Just go over and tell them what you feel like the Lord's saying to you about them. You have that kind of power in your heart to give to each other. So, amen. Amen. Bless you guys. Have a great day.